they are however more than one single chemical compound. Okay, now let's switch over there again for a little. The one a way on the left. How would that look? There are two different two compounds. Okay, so what we're going to start talking about. This is going to be kind of the last little bit that I'm going to do uh, before I do uh, modules of my PIV. Um, we're going to talk about, and this is very short. So. What is flatness? Well, it is a it's a generalization of, of actually it's a generalization of projective, which is a generalization of free. Um, so I'm going to give you what, what it means for a module to be flat. Um, and I'll give you some kind of other lessons for it. So we'll get that in brass tacks here. Definition. Uh, let M be an R module. We say that M is flat uh, if given any short exact sequence of R modules, say so if this is short exact, then so is the induced one. M B makes it R M C M zero and this is F tensor one M B tensor one M So what it means to be flat is um it preserves exact sequences when you when you tensor. Um, let me point out that we already know in general that if this is exact, then this is exact. So another way of thinking about this M is flat if given. F from A to B such that F is one to one, then F tensor one M from A tensor M to B tensor M is also one to one. Right, because we already know that the rest of the exactness is preserved anytime for the tensor product. So really what it means to be flat, flat is it behaves well with respect to one-to-one uh, -one module or one-to-one -one homomorphism. So, uh, for example, This is a ripoff of the example that we uh, did perhaps last time. If you have a so if you have this homomorphism from Z2 to Z4, uh, you 
keeping in mind. Let's let it sit here. Then So this is way not flat at all because it turns an injection into a zero mass. Um, theorem. <laughs> so I'm not really going to go to proof of this. Um, I'm going to cover flatness mostly, probably, I think the next time works out because I'm going to give, uh, there's some interesting conditions on flat in the physical domain. Oh, by the way, this is kind of the uh, exact sequence interpretation of this. Flat modules also tend to have, let me use this very loosely, something like a basis. Uh, obviously, flat modules in general can't have a basis, otherwise they'd be free, right? So if you have something that's free, if it's flat but not free, it can't really have a basis. But there's an interesting characterization in more like these volume on the commutative valve on flatness, uh, where they they have something that's very close to being basis. Um, let me give you the following theorem, uh, which I'll use as an exercise. X2, as a matter of fact. Uh, Let M be an R module. We have A implies B implies C for the conditions A, B, and C that I'm going to give you. A, M is free, B, M is C. So we already know that any free module is projective, um, and it's also true that every projective module is flat. Uh, and in general, you can't reverse any of these, right? Uh, in the, if you have, depending on what the ring is, let me give you an example. If the ring is a field, these are all equivalent, right? But in general, like in fact, even for Z, uh, some of these are not reversible for Z. These two are equivalent, the flat is different. Um, so uh, one of the homework exercises that I'm gonna give you next time uh, basically, what you're going to show is um, if you have, I, basically, you show that if you have a torsion free module over a PID, then you're flat. And I'll kind of I'll give you a little spoiler on this. If you look at, so you might think about this, if you look at uh, R to be the integers, and you take uh, your module to be Q. It's fairly easy to show that Q is not free and it's not projective. Right? Um, it's not free because if you try to form a basis and see what happens. It's a disaster quickly, and you can you can uh, you can bootstrap that into showing it's not projective. Right? Uh, however, Q is flat uh, C module, uh, and I'll give you proof of something a little bit more general in the homework. Um, I would encourage you uh, to try this yourself. Uh, in fact, proving M is free implies M is flat is pretty straightforward just doing the definition, right? To see what happens to the homomorphism on the free part. And once you got that, you can bootstrap that to project it as well. Uh, and there's a projection like theorem here. 
Blacks behave just like projection with regard to this style of theorem. Uh, then the direct sum black, if and only if mi is black. So if you notice, this is the exact analog of uh, the result we had for projected modules. Okay. Any questions? Okay, let me ask you all this. <clears throat> How many of you have taken um, A530, the linear algebra or matrix or whatever we call it? How many of you will take it? Right, much everybody. How many of you are thinking about taking the alpha prelim? Why a lot of you are? Well, I hope that pieces, parts of this next bit will help you on this. Obviously, we're beyond the syllabus for the alpha part, but this is going to have some intersection with, uh, from a different point of view, I think, what they, uh, some of the stuff they do in 8530. In particular, we're going to talk about modules of a principal ideal domain, uh, and we're going to use this to drive, um, well, to decompose a single linear transformation. That is to uh, uh, highlight its canonical forms. So, without further ado, uh, and how many of you all, so when you were in math class last semester, you probably, uh, I'm guessing, did um, classification of finitely generated Abelian groups, right? Uh, probably, you talk about invariant factors, uh, Maybe maybe not our elementary divisors, how to decompose things like this. Well, this is going to look very much like it because you can mimic everything that you have there. And I may skip over certain parts of that because really the important thing about that, although it's probably not clear when you first do it, but the reason that uh, you have the fundamental theorem of finitely generated building groups is because. Finitely generated billion groups are finitely generated Z modules, right? So, and, and Z is PID. So, basically, we're going to take that observation and, and stretch that to, to PIDs and then have some application to it. Modules over the PID. And not forms. Okay, so I got to start with a book notation here. So in this section, we will always have R be commuted to one, usually a PID. In fact, my default would usually be that. Uh, and of course, all modules are unitary. So my definitions are more couch in terms of theorem. So we'll just grab it and growl. Theorem 7, uh, 1, 1. Uh, let's A be an R module. And at first, R is just an integral domain. A is an R module. R is an integral domain. A is some element, little a is some element of the module. Uh, and um, Better. But this is this is just the set of R and R sets of R A. So 
This symbol right here is just everything that kills the element A. Uh, sometimes this is called the annihilator of A. So it's everything that when you hit it with, uh, hit A with a, that element, you get zero. Um, okay. Not only is this a subset of R, it's in fact an ideal. Um, B, uh, A sub T, um, A is my module, A sub T is just all the stuff. Sort of seen this from another point of view uh, earlier. So A sub T uh, is all the stuff in A where it's got a non zero annihilator. So there's something other than zero that kills this. Uh, this is often called the torsion submodule. Um, let me give you an example before I go on too far. Uh, let's suppose that R is the ordinary integers. That's a good kind of thing to keep in mind. A and A, then what is this thing? It's the set of integers such that RA is zero. So really, at the end of the day, uh, this thing consists of all elements for Z that have finite order. Right. Uh, C, So when you take R and you mod out by the annihilator of A, you get it's isomorphic to the ideal, or I, I should say the submodule, the sigmoid submodule generated by A. Now let me up the voltage here. Um, it's an isomorphism that says modules. Yes. So let me add an assumption here. R is a PI building and P is non zero prime. Okay, so now we're moving from interval bump domain to PID. Then uh, PIA is zero. PIA is zero, so that is uh, So if a power of this prime kills A, which is equivalent to saying the ideal generated by the power of the prime uh, is contained in the annihilator of A, then this ideal, well, it's got to be an ideal uh, that contains this. So... Uh, and E, if if it turns out that the annihilator of the element A is equal to PVI, then P to the JA is not zero. Then 
then all smaller powers of p uh, is not sufficient to kill uh, a. Okay. Um, let's at least skip through some of this garbage. Um, This is an ideal of R. Um, well, let's suppose uh, well, let me point out what's going to be the subgroup criteria, but I guess I need to be uh, non empty set. Somebody tell me why these values are not empty. I can see it. A and B and one of the whole one. Um, we, I think we did this in a more specialized condition, perhaps. Um, okay, that's fine. I can skip this over. Of course, this is uh, not empty because it's zero element. It's easy to verify that it's a subgroup uh, and a module. And this one right here, uh, this one didn't need domain, if I remember right. Uh, this worked anyway. This, however, did need you had an integral domain, right? That was very important here. The last one, what do you think? We get the final mod from R and R A. There you go. The multiplication by A. Here's the obvious R mod's homomorphism. <laughs> Um, it's easy to verify this is an R module homomorphism, and it's clearly onto, is it not? Right? And the kernel of B is the set of R and R such that R A equals zero, which is precisely that. So by the first isomorphism, we don't get our result. Right? Okay. This needed, um, this needed uh, just ring. Uh, this appears to just need ring as well. This needed domain. Now we got to throw up the PID here. Um, so what this one's saying is, if PIA equals zero. Well, where can we go from that? You know that pi plus times a, uh, if we multiply by p, it still be zero. So the higher uh, powers of p must be contained in the a. Okay, okay. So that first statement means this, right? Therefore, it's contained in, right? Uh, this is where PID creeps in. It because of the fact that this is principal ideal domain, and this is generated by single element C, right? And note, PI is in, therefore, PI equals ZR. So, in particular, I'm going to use UFD here, right? Because we have a PID as a UFD. So, Z buys PI. And as R is a, this means that C is P to the J, 
So between zero and I, okay? Therefore, this generator has to be a power of two. And this last one, once you have this, if this is uh, generated by PDI, then no smaller power can uh, kill A. Because if the smaller power killed A, then this would be generated by the smaller power. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Um, So I am going to uh, theorem seven one two. But that'd be a free module of PID. Oh, PID R. Uh, Yeah. If M uh, is a submodule, then M is free. And Rank of submodule is less than or equal to the rank of F. <laughs> and this is this is the more general analog of uh, if you have the subgroup of a free abelian group, uh, then it's free abelian rank less than or equal to the rank of the parent group. So I'm going to leave that one as an exercise for now. So I'm going to rip off uh, a couple of corollaries here. So point three first, let R be a PID. And suppose that A is a finite, is an N generated R module. Uh, then any submodule of A. can be generated by okay um Uh, 
Uh, let's, let's think about the corollary here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a simplified version of this. Let me point out that uh, if A is an n-generated free R module, we were free, then I could use this theorem directly, right? Because what the theorem says is if you have A and it's generated by and generated. It says that you, if you have any submodule of this, it's generated by less than or equal to that many elements, right? But the problem is, is A is not free. Well, it may not be free. So how do we get around that? Okay, good, good, good. Generators again. Okay. Yes, A is a homomorphic image of the free model, and as you point out, we can go a little stronger than that. It's a homomorphic image of N generated, if we like. So, because what we can do is we can just consider the set of generators this. We can treat that as. Uh, it's free on that set and just set up that, that map, right? So take every one of the generators that's A1 up to AN and just treat it like a symbol. Let F do the free module on those and then map that to A, right? Am I okay with it? So how does that help? So now what we have. is the homomorphic image of this. Let me be a the free image of B is also a good. Okay. So the idea here is Consider, let's say M, which is, uh, I guess I should call this something, shouldn't I? Look at the pre image of whatever that submodule is as a submodule of that pre. Right. So that's everything in that direct sum that goes into B, right? We know that this is a submodule of this thing. So now we can apply our theorem, right? M is submodule of free module right M. So, M is generated by M less than or equal to N elements. Therefore, B is generated by less than or equal to M less than or equal to N elements. And actually, it's probably equal to so the effect of free energy. Right. Everybody okay with that? So that's how we kind of get around that. Maybe it's not a free thing. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, here's another corollary. Uh, and I, I hinted on this one a little bit earlier. Let's suppose that M, or, uh, what? Let P be a 
they get are the IP. Then P is projected. Get the known here. So what we what this corollary tells us is in the case of principal ideal domains, projected and free are the same thing. Uh, but as I alluded to earlier, this is not true for flat. Flat might be different. That part's always true. The, 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 the idea or anything like that. Uh, what about the other direction? So why is projected good enough for free? Then there exists free module. Right. F. Uh, so that F derives morally. B derives something. A. So, since P is a submodule, Of a free module, because all you have to do is just make P direct some K and it's the sum of that free module. Uh, then here's the and there you go. Okay. Any Okay, um, so we already know uh, a module is, we already know that even Z, right, Z is the PID, Z has modules that are not flat, because earlier today we, looked, we noticed that Z2 is a Z module that's not flat. Um, projected and free are the same thing, and here is a, here's a theorem that gives us something else if we restrict to finitely generated. Uh, any finitely generated torsion free module. Torsion free module. Over. PID is free. Okay. Uh, it turns out you need both hypotheses. I'm going to give you a little spoiler that's going to come up on the homework. Uh, we need it to be torsion free because over Z, we've seen that Z2 is, is, is not uh, free. I mean, it's, it's certainly not free. Uh, we also need finitely generated because I will give you an example of a Z module that is torsion free but not finitely generated. The rationals. Uh, and this one is not free. The rationals is not a free Z module. But you're in business if you've got no torsion and you're finitely generated. So this should come up in the description. Um, finally, generated. Or free model.
and let's give it some finite set of generators. Generated by those elements. Um, note, for all five, XI is a linearly independent set. That is, I'm not claiming that the whole thing is linearly independent set, but if you pull out a single generator and just consider that single set that's linearly independent, uh, what hypothesis guarantees this? It's torsion free. Because if you have R terms, say, X1 and 0, uh, if it's torsion free, if the model is torsion free, that forces the R to be 0, which is exactly what you need for the singleton set to be linearly independent, right? Everybody okay with that? So uh, let's let. Necessary. Uh, let's say X one to X A be a maximal uh, linearly independent uh, subset of A. Among all generating, among all finite uh, generating sets, um, we find one that's maximal. Now, uh, notice that you've got somewhere to start because the singleton sets are linearly independent. So build one that's maximal length. And I hope that that maximal linearly independent set also spans all day. And then I'll have what I need. Okay, so uh, so this collection, uh, Generated. So this is a linearly independent set, right? And so its span, which F, has to be free because it's got a basis. So we're going to let that be uh, a free submodule of A. Um, if, that, if that equals A, then I'm done. Right, because now that I've, I've got it today, it's free. Um, what if it's not? The rest of the X, uh, X7, the generators of A, is R linear combinations of R set, right? Yeah, yeah. So what, I, what I'm going to do is, uh, it, and I think it will be clear pretty quickly why I need finiteness here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is suppose... XJ not in L or for all indices k plus one and bigger, we'll assume that this is not in uh, oh not for all. Uh, So, of course, if this is not all day, then at least one of these X sub J's has to be 
not in it. Otherwise, it's got all of them in there, and then people say, and we're, we're done. So we'll suppose we uh, find one. So notice that for every such J, which xj is not an f, then uh, I think uh, then what we have is there exists rj r such that uh, Rj, Xj, e by index set, right? I know that's the RJ not the wrong thing. Okay, first of all, uh, how do I get the, uh, how do I get this? Why does there exist an RJ that allows me to write this as a linear combination? Otherwise, it contradicts the maximality of. Okay. Okay. Um, that's right. There has to be a linear dependence relation, otherwise maximality is contradicted. That's a that's a good way to look at it. Right? And RJ is not zero because there's a linear independence of the first one, right? Because if RJ is zero, then this side of the equation turns into zero, which forces all the other states. Everybody ever fix this one? Now, um, I'm going to define R. I'm going to let R be the product of all these RJs, the product of all the RJs, which we get an equation like this. And let's notice that. Uh, when you multiply R times X, this is contained in that. Right? Because any of the first X, X and K's are in that, and uh, for all the ones beyond that that are not in here, they've all got this property, and now you multiply by all the factors you need to throw them back into that. All right, everybody okay with that? Because every one of these XJs here has this RJ. I multiply them together, every one of these tosses it back into F. All right, notice this is why I needed to find this condition here, right? Because if this basis were infinite, then this product might not be well defined because there might be infinitely many XJs that have this. Um, so, so therefore, RA is in F. And so we consider the homomorphism. B uh, from A to F given by B of A sorry so in other words what I've done is I've found a homomorphism uh, from the submodule A to F, right? Uh, and notice that 
B is one to one because R A equals zero implies uh, uh, but implies A equals zero. Right, R is fixed here. So A is isomorphic to a submodule. But any submodule of that is free. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah, that's kind of a cool trick. And you definitely need finiteness. There are counterexamples for uh, in, uh, modules that are not finite to generate. So yeah. your maximal set is the basis or not? <laughs> We don't know, right? Now we only know that it's just... Well, so what, what the show, well, yeah, matching set has to be a basis, right? Okay, other questions? All right. Well, I will see you folks on Wednesday.